We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Lindsey Patterson, Mike Santagata here. Mike, how are you? I'm doing pretty great. Um, can't think of, you know, anything crazy that's going on, really. <laughs> oh, you know what? <laughs> Wendy said the Krabby Patty and the Pineapple Frosty. I tried it. I had to. There you the go, review, Mike. The, the review? That burger's what? not worth it. That, that, that burger's like a normal Dave single with like a tartar sauce mayo type of thing. Frosty, well worth it. Well worth the frosty. I might want to I might want to try to get another one of those before it's gone. That frosty banged, but burger, who cares? You know what? Fast food, it's getting up there in the price. So I, <laughs> I'll stay oh yeah. Me. It wasn't cheap. It wasn't <laughs> cheap, but I mean, I don't know. <laughs> are you one of those people we'll move on after this but are you one of those people that put your french fry in the frosty oh yeah i've done that forever mm -hmm. yeah yep. especially especially chocolate i mean i don't know about a pineapple frosty and doing that but the chocolate frosty oh, yeah for 100%. sure and at my college we were the penguins so they called that mixed one the penguin i would get that too okay all right well mike's having a big week you know he's, he's <laughs> <big> week. <laughs> i tried the crappy patty <laughs> Other than that, there's really not a whole lot going on. Um, as far as Cincinnati, it finally feels like football weather outside. Unfortunately, the defense isn't playing much football, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, some of the things I actually want to start out with, because we record the pod as soon as the game's over, so I really don't get a chance to listen to the press conferences um, and, and more of the quotes of what Zach Taylor and quarterback Joe Burrow said. And I think a few things stood out for me when I listened to Joe Burrow's press conference later on when he just talked about, look, we're not a championship caliber team right now. And he's right. They're not. They're definitely not. This offense, you could say, has that level, but the defense, you, you have to put it all together and they're just not there. He also added there's going to be tough conversations and, and some people aren't going to like those conversations. And I think all of that stuff is extremely important because yes, we hear from Joe Burrow. We'll hear from him tomorrow. We record on Thursday. We'll hear from head coach Zach Taylor tomorrow, but these conversations are happening behind the scenes. I don't know what that means, but Mike, if I were to ask you when Joe Burrow says some people aren't going to like those conversations, what do you think he's, he's referring to? Ah. Huh. Hmm. Great question. I honestly, I mean, I'm not, do you have an idea? Cause I, I don't want to, it's hard because I don't want to speculate too much no. because I'm like, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but I'm also like, eh. um, I mean, really maybe it just ties back to people got to play better. And like you talk about Jamari got to coach better, got to play better, got to do everything better. Even though the offense was awesome. He could be talking about the defense. Uh, but I feel like he usually keeps it within his own area. I mean, I guess last week, though, it kind of was a little bit of a I have to be perfect felt to me a little bit like, a, come on, defense. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I really got to put up 40. So maybe it has to do with that. I guess I'm not 100% sure. I don't, I'm not, I'm not equipped that my forte is not reading into the press conferences. So this, Maybe more towards you. What What do you think? <laughs> Man, reading into it, I I don't know. Um, Joe Burrow has said before a couple of weeks ago that he really doesn't, you know, have a message or, or or say too much on the defensive side of the ball when it comes to how they play football. He sticks to the offense. So I don't know if if it's kind of a bigger picture situation. And and look, we're at the point right now, and and we'll get to the defensive issues and the play versus the Baltimore Ravens, just honestly, this whole entire season. But I, I do think it is it is a message across the board. And look, Joe Burrow didn't say that. He's really good in his press conferences. He doesn't throw anybody under the bus. He actually gave credit to the coaching staff several times in his press conference and says, I feel like our coaches are, are handling those situations just fine in those conversations. And of course, he might just be saying that to avoid anything. But, um, you know, we don't know what happens behind the scenes, the conversations that are happening. But I do think that Joe Burrow um, has has a big say, you know, on, on things that are happening behind the scenes. And, and obviously that infamous um, meeting that they had right before they met with the team after the Monday Night Football loss. So, you know, it's, it's a huge week for this club. Uh, we'll look back a little bit on, on the offense and defensive side right now. But I think when Joe Burrow talks that a lot of people are listening. And I think he was honest, um, you know, saying, I know that I, I watched Good Morning Football and they were like, we're not talking about the Bengals. Joe Burrow says they're not a caliber team, a championship caliber team until they, you know, prove otherwise. They're just not worth talking about. And that was kind of the first time I just heard Joe Burrow say, we know what the issues are. We know what the problem is. 
you know, they're not trying to just ignore me like, oh, there's still time left. Oh, we can still do it. It was like, no, we know why we're in the position we're in. We can't finish games. And for how much I, I will blame the defense because it is the problem for me right now. I do think, you know, there are opportunities on the offensive side of the ball. And it sounds so silly to say this and I feel terrible to say it to finish when you can in the end you know, when you do get those few opportunities towards the end to maybe to get, get a few more yards when they're just running the ball to, to kick the field goal. And I know a lot of people are questioning Zach and why he did that, or, you know, the interception at the end, Joe Burrow balled out. When you throw for almost 400 yards, you have a career high five touchdowns. You should win a football game. And to be able to do that three weeks of elite performance from Joe Burrow, I would be feeling like my defense and my team let me down. I honestly would if I'm if I'm the offensive side of the ball. I would have a really bad taste in my mouth to say, we're putting up 33 points, we're putting up 38 points. We should be winning these football games with how the offense is playing. And I feel like the offense still hasn't hit its ultimate high. I think they could do even more, which is absolutely crazy because of what the performances they're showing every week because it's been fun seeing Jamar Chase out there, seeing T. Higgins out there, different um, running backs. Obviously, they couldn't get a running game going versus the Baltimore Ravens, but – that, you know, that's the only thing I can think of is, you know, what more can the offense do right now? And and I don't know how sustainable that is every week to to expect this offense to put up 30 plus points to keep you in a game when, you know, I was I was optimistic about it. I was like Joe Burrow's playing MVP caliber. His team is one and four. Um, the point differential. One more thing before we get into this offense is five. It, it's crazy. It's absolutely insane when you think about where they're at right now when it comes to the stats. And it's a lot of it's a lot of bad luck too. Honestly, you know, you, you look at how some of these games have ended outside of missed tackles and how bad the defenses played. They still had opportunities to win every single game they've played so far this season, and they just haven't been able to close it. And that's a problem. And that's sometimes what happens with bad teams, but it's so hard for me to say it's just a bad team when I see this offense perform. So let's go to the offense. Joe Burrow, a little bit look back what you were able to see in, against the Baltimore Ravens in that defense. I mean, the offense was awesome, right? <laughs> That's kind of uh, up until the very end there. So, you know, some main points that I saw, I talked about it um, in the preview. It feels when they've played the Ravens before, it felt congested. It felt tight. Mm -hmm. It felt, you know, like 12 yards was the max Joe Burrow could throw. Clearly not true in this game. Uh, so, they were able to push the ball down the field. They, it seemed like a concerted effort to push the ball down the field against this defense, even when they were in two high coverages. Um, the deep ball to Chase, that was, I guess, a single high look. The deep ball to Higgins that was missed, that was a two high look. So it just felt like they were finding ways to finally punish those two high coverages deep down the field. Um, and even that deep ball to Chase, it's what I've thought about with the two high stuff where – Look, it's well and good to say my safety will match Chase and run with him on mm -hmm. this play. So they get Chase on the post safety on that play, and Marlon Humphrey doesn't help. That safety doesn't want to be alone with Jamar Chase 30 yards down the field, and you you could see it. Like, he mm -hmm. got spun around. So that's what I mean when I'm saying, like, yeah, just punish those safeties anyway. Like, if they're going to play quarters and safety is supposed to be ma basically man-to-man -man after 12 yards with that wide receiver – Okay, bet. Like, I'd love that matchup if he was lined up on him. Yeah, you have to protect for it. And I think the Bengals' offensive line has been very good. We'll have to talk about Orlando Brown because I think he is off to the best start of his career. But, yeah, that was the first thing I noticed was that they're willing to push the ball down the field. They actually were running the ball okay early, but it felt like the Ravens kind of adjusted and made some changes and the run game became poo-poo after that. Um, not really worth trying to get to. And, I mean, Joe Burrow is just amazing in this game up until the interception, and then the ball got taken. You know, he got sacked, and then it felt like the ball got kind of taken out of his hands. So on the interception, I've listened to some people talk about it. I've looked up some stuff. I've thought about it. So they were in one high coverage, one high man, man free is what it would be called because I don't think there was a middle field shallow defender, a rat, a hole, whatever. Um, so this is true. Man to man with one deep safety. The Bengals are running a concept called dragon lion. This is a very common concept for them. And they hit it a ton in this game, including three of their touchdowns, both slants to T Higgins and the flat to chase Brown. Dragon means slant flat. 
you usually read all these inside out. So you're going to read the flat to the slant. Although when it's Jamar Chase, I think your eyes just get a little locked and you know it's man coverage. <laughs> but we'll get there. And the other side is Lion. That's double slant. So you have a slant on the inside, slant on the outside. Mike Gesicki was running the slant on the inside. T. Higgins was running the slant on the outside. I think I think this was just another example of Joe Burrow loving Jamar Chase because I actually was told mm -hmm. by a former college quarterback, you can break the one high, two high rules here. So you can't read this thing all the way across the board. If you start on the right side, you can't read the left. You read inside to outside, which in that case, that guy's probably going to be end up inside. It doesn't matter. Inside to outside to just throwing the check down or running around and trying to make something happen. And really running around and making something happen here isn't the greatest idea just because your offensive line is expecting you to be at seven yards and expecting that ball to be out within two and a half seconds, if not less. So, and that's why the quarterback takes one step on the drop. Usually your drop is tied to your read. One step, and he kind of clutches and then throws. The reason, so what I mentioned with the college quarterback I talked to was former college quarterback I talked to, he said it doesn't really matter when you get one high man coverage, you're allowed to break the rules because the rule is one high, you read the slant flat side, two high, you read the double slant side. That's really for the zone because that's going to put your curl hook, your hook to curl defender in a bind on the one high side. On the other side, you'll put your weak hook defender into a bind. But because it doesn't exactly work that way, on the other, it's it's a concept that's good against everything. And then slants are always good against man. The issue is Marlon Humphrey is selling out to stop this slant. He lines up inside, very far inside shade on Jamar Chase on this. I think pre-snap, you could go, okay, I think I have man. And they motioned, so it was confirmed. I have man here. I love Jamar Chase. On the other side, if it's not, and maybe the Bengals do make them follow the one high, two high rule here. On the other side, I've got T. Higgins, and I think it was Brandon Stevens or mm -hmm. somebody like that against yeah. him who's playing outside leverage. The slant is breaking to the inside. I would like Joe Burrow to break the rule here and just throw that to T. Higgins. The other part is you're in a situation of a absolute no turnover. Mm -hmm. This is where, like, I get the idea, like, throw it to Jamar Chase because Jamar Chase, even against inside leverage against Marlon Humphrey, he's going to cross his face and win that probably eight out of ten times, seven out of ten times, something like that. And you just feel really good about it. It's, um, it's how often do you get single man-to-man -man coverage for your best receiver your best friend. Well, he really sold out for that slant. And Jamar Chase, like he said, ran a crappy route. And that's what you end up with. Um, so I thought it was interesting to dive into it, though, because I was wondering, like, can you break this rule? Because, like, if I lined up as a quarterback and I saw, like, yeah, he's cheating the slant. Could I just go there? You've, like, nobody's going to actually stop this. Like, the reason you don't run this against cover three is because you're going to run – the one guy into a hook and the other guy is going to stay with the curl flat, but they're not running cover three. They're running a single high man coverage. So he's got no help. Why don't I just throw the slant over there? I think it's something to learn from. And I think the other part of this to learn from, we've talked plenty about it is that doesn't mean take the ball out of your quarterback's hand because one bad thing happened. No, I guess on the next drive, there was a sack. He was protected well this entire game. And he made one mistake throwing the ball one bad mistake throwing the ball. The idea that we liked the field position we were in and that's why they just ran it three times. They trust the kicker, yada, yada. I do think it was not first down. If Joe Burrow checks out of a play, it was clearly second down to me. If he checked out something, because he goes to the line and makes a check and you're not going to check into a run. That's going to be two get two back power. Like you got to be kind of ready for that. You can't just check into it. The second down, they just run inside zone. That's a check. That's a check run to that. Like, kill this, we're just going to run the inside zone play. Um, at least to me, that's what I would think. I don't see a lot of people check into, you know, like complex runs. I see them check into their bread and butter. So they checked into that, got nothing out of it. I also just want to say, like, even if that's true and I don't like a second and whatever run, not throwing on third down issue. And the biggest issue to me is the personnel on the field. T. Higgins exactly. not on the field for any of that. So, like, even if he's checking into a run, that's because on second down, Jamar Chase got a heavy bracket. Okay, where else can he go with the ball? Like, if that's the case and T. Higgins is on the other side, you could go, cool, I'll throw it to T. But because he's not on the field, they can cheat to Chase, and then you have to trust that one of these auxiliary types is going to be able to win 
and get open because it's probably getting some man coverage here. That's tough. That's that is that uh, just put your best player on the field. Even if Yoshi is a better blocker, which I think T's a pretty good blocking wide receiver, even if Yoshi's a better blocker, I mean, just the threat of T is going to pull defenders either out of the coverage or give him an opportunity to win, which he did the entire game. So those are all my offensive thoughts. I've kind of rambled a long time on that. No, I agree with you. Um, I just wanted one shot, just one shot in overtime. And, and if you don't say get rid of the ball, get rid of it so you can avoid the sack. But I just feel like in that opportunity, the way Jamar Chase was beating them, the way Joe Burrow was beating them, beating that defense, just to get five, seven, maybe a whole nother first down when it comes to yards. I mean, we watched last night the Kansas City Chiefs game. Um, you know, the 50-plus is not automatic. They have one of the best, if not best, kickers in football, and he missed a 51-yarder. So Evan kicked a 53-yarder. I know it was all the hold and everything like that, but at the same time, you could have helped your team you could have helped your kicker. And honestly, the way they were playing, they could have probably had a walk-off touchdown. And I know that they needed a field goal. I know they only needed a field goal to win the game. But just the way that they were able to beat that defense, I didn't like it. They played scared. N not, not Joe Burrow played scared because he played elite. He was amazing on Sunday. But I just felt like the overall picture of it was scared. It was playing not to lose, and you have to stop doing that. When you play to lose, because we've seen it again, we've talked about it on the podcast Sunday, it gave me Niners vibes, and over time, taking the ball out of Joe's hands when he was cooking in the fourth quarter, one of my favorite Joe Burrow games, and you did it again. And the Packers game, we can look at that one from a couple years ago, same thing. Help your kicker out, help your quarterback out, help your offense, help your whole entire team for getting that turnover anyways on the defensive side of the ball. And, and win the game. So it's just really that part's frustrating to look back on because I feel like that's what I keep remembering. Um, obviously, the 10 point swings when they had, they were up 10 points nine minutes ago, the Bengals offense was doing everything they could. And, and I think you even said it on the podcast Sunday, almost let the Ravens score too, too soon. Um, yeah. they, they did it so quickly that it was like, oh, oh no, there's still more time. Um, and it's just, I feel like it was managed a, a little wild. And it's hard for me because I know it's really easy to, the whole fire Zach Taylor chance and everybody wants to get Zach Taylor out of there. This offense has been producing every single game since the end of the Patriots game, the way that they've looked on the offensive side of the ball. I get it. He's the head coach. So he's in charge of these bigger decisions and they have to win that game. They have to win that game. You have to beat the Baltimore Ravens when you have the lead, when you are in control of the game in the second half. The Baltimore Ravens, some would say, are the best team in the NFL right now. You had a chance to find to, to do it at home, and they and they lost it in, in several different ways You know, to put that game away. They didn't even need to go to overtime if they would have managed it better in the fourth quarter. So it's really hard for me to point. Like Any negatives on the offensive side, I just, of course, didn't like the overtime. I, I didn't like anything about it. I didn't like – just playing it safe. And 53 is just, that's a long kick, man. Even though they have Evan, it's still, it's still a long kick to win the game, especially if you don't get it and they didn't. And everybody knows how that ended. So two, that's a two, two, two quick more things. Yeah. Uh, I was also mentioned this when Marlon Humphrey lines up heavy inside leverage, I wish there was just like a little hand. So it was just like, hey, Jamar, just run to go. Like <laughs> if he's going to cheat the slant, just run down the field. You're there's nobody <laughs> helping. Just, just a quick little, just, I don't know. Just like uh, something with the hand. Just be like, hey, run it go. Like, they've got that type of connection. I don't know if he has that ability to just have him just run whatever route he wants like he's Aaron Rodgers. But that's my one part. And the second part is if Joe Burrow did check into the run on second down, that's the only run that gained yards. The other two went for of no course. gain. That one gained three yards. So, you know, the, it wasn't the end of the world, I guess, to check no. into that one and gain a couple yards. I just wish the personnel was different because then he probably doesn't have to check into it. I think that's your, that's a really good point. Just like who was out in the field. It was obvious what the Bengals were doing. I knew I'm at the game. I'm watching it happen right in front of my eyes. And I said, I know what they're doing. They're just going to run the ball, get see if they can get a few more yards this whole entire time. So, of course, the Baltimore Ravens defense knows what they're going to be doing when they look at the personnel out there. And it's just like, come on, get creative, do something. And it's just unfortunate. It's easy to critique right now. I mean, Goodness, it's just it's very frustrating because of Joe Burrow's performance and the way he's playing out of all the NFL quarterbacks out there. And he's he's healthy. 
Um, his offense is fun. They're using different guys. They're getting creative. What we've always wanted with this offense, it, it has felt stale at times, um, you know, after maybe the 2022 AFC championship game. And then obviously Joe had the injury last year. Uh, they were getting it going before the injury. And then and then here they are now. So it's just, it feels like wasted games. And, and I'm not ready to give up on the season yet, but it's they're just in such a hole of, you need you need something to turn around and, and it needs to be everybody. And it's just really unfortunate because again, nine played his face off and I don't want it to be, you know, it was the offense's fault or anything like that. It's just kind of how the game ended. Now let's flip to the defensive side. Unfortunate news. Um, Dax Hill. I, we are team Dax Hill. I feel like we've, we, we've talked plenty about Dax Hill on the defensive side of the ball. He's been a pro since he's arrived in Cincinnati being put in that position, safety, waiting to play safety, played safety. No, we're going to get a cornerback. And he was having a really good year, at least a good start to the cornerback position. We could say maybe his best start in his NFL career. Um, and it's just cut short. And it's really unfortunate because when you look at the secondary right now, Cam Taylor Britt is not playing like a cornerback one. I feel like Dax was, um, now he's out, he's out for the season. Don't know what his future looks like. He'll obviously be on the team next year, but they have to make a fifth year option and their defense is, is struggling. I think they had 15 missed tackles in that game versus the Baltimore Ravens. They blitzed 41 times against Lamar Jackson and they can't get home except for one time. And it just, well, it's just, I think a lot of those are run blitzes too. When, when Lou talks about how many blitzes they had, um, he's not just including blitzes to rush the passer. He was also including the blitzes of why the run defense was pretty good, but you know, sending extra heat that way too. But yeah, they still blitzed a ton, even just rushing the passer. I just 41 blitzes. And I don't remember how many times Lamar dropped back, but it might be less than 41 times. I'm going to real quick, I'm on the page. So I'm looking it up. Uh, <clears throat> That would be out of his 42 attempts. So oh, it's definitely it's not all but one. Yeah, so I think it's 20 something. So like half his attempts, they did blitz. But still, but still to not, you know, there's no pressure. And obviously Lamar is an athlete. He knows what he's doing out there. He can get out of it. He obviously had a huge throw, uh, was able to get the ball back and make a touchdown throw. But overall, I mean, your defense and I'm not even mad about the rush defense. Like I feel like they've been fine when it comes to, to just at least stopping the run right now. It, and that sounds crazy, but everything else, it's just bad. It's all bad. Even Trey Hendrickson, I don't feel like he's getting home right now when you need to bank on at least one of your guys. Um, Miles Murphy was obviously back out there, which is we'll see what that looks like with him and Sam Hubbard. Sam Hubbard did have some bright spots for what it has looked like for him most of the season. But overall, when you look at the safety position and you are the Cincinnati Bengals, I do not think that they're going to make this move going into the New York Giants game. But honestly, I would think about it. I don't know if I can watch Von Bell and Geno Stone play on the field together anymore. It is a liability on their defense. They're both slow. I mean, Geno was talked about as this like free safety. He's going to be a free safety type. You know, he goes on sideline to side. No, not, not on this team. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I hate bringing this up all the time. So I, I just have questions about it. What is so difficult about the safety play on this defense? Because there's only been one guy that's been a real good safety. You know, Von Bell is pretty good in his prime here. But just to be honest, the only guy was really good. And they keep bringing guys in. And they are so much worse in this defense than they are anywhere else. It's a little bit confusing. It's the thing I'm most confused about, at least. What's going on? Like, is this defense just extremely difficult to understand? And then you have a guy like Jordan Battle, who a lot of us think played well. And then Lou's saying, like, nah, no. Nah. No, you're not seeing what he's doing wrong. It's like, yeah. okay, but like, what's going on? Like, if the defense is so difficult on the safety position, why is it always bargain bin free agents that are getting tossed into this defense? And why wouldn't you just pay the guy that's good at it? Like, <laughs> that was my biggest question. Like, does the Lou Anarumo defense only work with a Jesse Bates type safety? And if that's the case, A, that's kind of hard to sustain. And B, you had it and you let the guy walk over guaranteed money. So I don't know. And I don't know if this defense would be great with Jesse Bates and the rest of this roster because I think this roster is kind of bad. Well, no, he probably would have had a turnover in one of these games. That's for sure. I think so. I think that that is also possible. Gino Stone, the ball magnet. There's tip balls and overthrows in this game, and he's not near any of them. And the thing is, in Baltimore, he was. He was always in the right position. He was in a play. He was in a place like, yeah, he's not making some crazy interception, but he's in the right spot. And he's coming down with these balls that are tips and overthrows. You got to have them. 
you got to have those plays where you get the chance to pick the ball off. And he hasn't. He hasn't been able to. I mean, Von Bell made the one interception, but really that was a Trey Hendrickson pick. Yeah. It, that ball is just – it flew to him perfectly, right? <laughs> it wasn't because he was in the right spot. It was because the ball got knocked out of Dalton's hand as he threw it. So I don't know. This defense is – a whole lot of frustrating, but like you bring up with the safeties, you know what? Like the, the most frustrating part to me was at least the past four weeks, I had the cope to say Jordan Battle would fix this. He gets in there and it's terrible. What is, so what's the fix? Because I, I don't think I am – I don't think that I have enough cope in me to say that Dejon Anthony and Tyson Anderson will fix this. I, yeah. I don't think I can go there. Yeah, and, and I want to say this really quickly because I, I hate that I'm doing this, but I, I feel like it's just timely right now. I feel like I've made a lot of excuses for the Bengals not paying a lot of guys. And I honestly am kind of changing my mind on the whole T. Higgins thing because I'm like, oh, no, you can't pay two receivers. Who else are you paying? Who else um, are you paying? But that's, exactly, but that's exactly what I'm getting to. I, I've changed my mind on this whole entire mindset where I'm like, you're going to have you're gonna have to figure it out. Like, you're going to have to figure it out. You're not going to franchise tag him again. You might need to pay T. Higgins and Jamar Chase. They are playing like two number one wide receivers in the NFL right now. And then I look over on the defensive side and I say, look, I, I always hate this conversation, but I have to bring it up because he proves it every single time I'm watching the Atlanta Falcons. They're always on prime time, it feels like. So I'm always watching Jesse Bates. And I said to myself, I, I understood why they didn't pay him in my brain. When it happened, I said, I understand because they don't value the safety position and they don't want to pay the guaranteed money. So I was like, okay, Jesse's moving on. I'm really going to miss him. Loved him in Cincinnati. He was awesome. It was so fun. He played at an all pro level. He's at playing at an all pro level again, will be an all pro. And then today I, I have to just admit, I'm completely wrong about the Jesse Bates thing. I, I'm late to it. I am. This team thought they could mask it and fix it. And they have failed over and over. And the money that they have failed and the attempts and the draft capital they have used to yeah. replace Jesse Bates, they could have just signed him. They could have just signed him. And it, and he would have been here. And it was their homegrown drafted talent. And they failed. And this team has not been able to recover since. And I know that it's easy to, to – I mean, I can look at Von Bell and he's slow. I mean, there are times on the field where I'm like, could have made a play. Probably could have had a turnover. When he's Shoot. chasing Charlie Kolar, their Drew Sample down the field and he's losing ground, yeah, yeah. it's pretty tough. I mean, they were joking about it in the Baltimore Ravens post game about yeah. about these guys. I mean, it's just absolutely Geno Stone's on the on Lamar Jackson's highlight reel right now. Um, but it's just, it's really, it, it's watching these guys. And I've I said it earlier this week. I do not think the safety replacement is on the team. That doesn't mean I want to continue to watch Geno Stone and Von Bell out there. I do think right. you need. I think honestly, I'm taking Geno Stone off the field. I, I know Von Bell is super slow. I, I'm I'm just he's he's not playing well at all. <laughs> like out of Bell all tackles, things. Bell tackles. Like that. Look, they they don't have a lot of guys that do that. They so don't. Bell, ta <laughs> Bell tackles, uh, battle tackles. Hey, if we're gonna be slow and we're gonna be bad, we're gonna at least make the tackles we can. But yeah, I, you know what? I I kind of thought of this today. You know, it's the Jesse Bates thing is gonna haunt us for years. And it will. But, it will. But it feels like the Bengals, it's not even about the position. It feels like they don't value the red chip talent. You know, blue chip talent is like you're truly elite. You're Joe Burrow, you're Jamar Chase, Chad Johnson, Carson Palmer, just, and I guess, you know, there are some red red chip guys that draft, or, uh, paid before. Andrew Whitworth, Willie Anderson, et cetera. You know, like yeah. guys that can play at like a Hall of Fame level, mm -hmm. which uh, maybe – Palmer was a little out there for that, but uh, hey. the red chips, the, he was a quarterback. So you got to pay him um, red chip talents is what I mean here. T Higgins hasn't made a pro bowl. Hasn't been an all pro Jesse Bates, one second team, all pro, no pro bowls. Kevin Zeitler, no pro bowls, no all pros. Justin Smith. I don't believe any pro bowls are all pros in Cincinnati. Mm -mm. And you get through all these guys and you're like, they would rather pay the average talent that it could even be in the same position group. When you think of, you know, I like Clint Bowling, but Clint Bowling, he wasn't as good as Zeitler. Willie Anderson, not Willie is, oh my goodness. <laughs> Obviously, he was blue chip. He got paid. Uh, I meant to say Andre Smith. Andre Smith, it was like, yeah, he's he's all right, but yeah. you're paying him, and then you're not going to pay other guys on the team. And I just look at that, 
really frustrated. You know, Gino Atkins, Blue Chip Talent, maybe Carlos Dunlap would be a red chip guy you'd talk about, but he yeah. even, I think, made a Pro Bowl when he was he here. Did. I don't think he was a blue chip talent before he got paid. Um, so I was thinking of that, just like, do they just not value that? Because these red chip guys keep leaving. TJ, Hushman's out of that would also be a red chip guy they let leave. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just they're really good, but they're not elite. And these guys sometimes leave Zeitler, Bates, a reader would be another red chip maybe to them, Honestly. but that's a lot of the positional value. Justin Smith, they leave and they're much better. So they become blue chips elsewhere. So that's, I think, part of my worry with T. Higgins, why this is so similar to me, is just like I'm looking at another guy that I go like, this guy's really good. Even if he's and not getting the Pro Bowl or the All-Pro, I think to me, that's a health thing. And that's, you know, availability is the best ability type thing. That's frustrating for me to watch and just be like, that guy's really good. Marvin Jones would be another red chip uh, guy I'm talking about. But, mm -hmm. you know, like they just don't want to pay for that. And is that because it feels like this front office always has to win the deal? Because you're not going to win a lot of deals with these no. red chip guys because you have to kind of pay them up near the blue chip level. But who else are you paying? Because I would rather have T. Higgins than I would for them to – I mean, Kim Taylor Prince going to cost – Somewhere near the same. I mean, maybe not anymore. I'm not ready to pay like, Cam was, yet. <laughs> well, that was the only guy people talked about paying when was yeah. talking about, like, you know, Tegan is leaving. Talk about free agency. You don't know if these guys are going to be good fits. Look at Stone. Stone was a pretty good player last year. Get out of the Even contract. It wasn't town around him. Yeah, now you got to get out of this contract. You look at yeah. a lot of free agent whiffs before, and it's like sometimes that just doesn't fit. You know T. Higgins is good. You know he mm -hmm. fits. So just pay him. Because I don't want to watch him walk and then have another experience where I'm watching a Jesse Bates on every primetime game and make a turnover against these great offenses and they win the game. And it's frustrating. And I, I still love Jesse. I'm glad you went to the NFC. But like watching that and watching the Bengals safeties after, it's just it's night and day. And I know the Bengals draft wide receivers well. They do these things well. But I just are you really going to build another hole in this team? Because right now, going into this year, I didn't think there were a ton of holes. But right now, the defense, it's all holes. Every part of the defense is a hole. Other than, I don't even know. Your best edge rusher, I guess, he's not a hole. Your linebacker unit, you probably don't have any holes there, even if they don't look as good as they used to, especially perhaps just look at a step slower. But you also have Akeem Davis Gaither and like mm -hmm. Muma Jung Meta, some guys you can feel pretty good about. I don't know. Like, I, I don't think I would want to build another hole in this team because I know the Bengals too. If they don't pay T Higgins, you're probably looking at a first or a second round pick at wide receiver. Yeah. And, and I, you know what you have. I, I've said it before, when I watch the way this offense looks right now, I still think it has a few more gears and that's insane to think because this team could put yeah. up 40 points every game if they wanted to offensively. And you know why? You got guys like T. Higgins. You have Jamar Chase out there. You have Yoshi, who's playing that wide receiver three role. Eric Hall, some of your rookies are stepping up. Joe Burrow has protection. This offense, I want to be excited about if the season does not go as planned. I know they're one and four, so I would say it's not going as planned. Um, and, and if they just, it's a lost season. I want this offense to still be together going into 2025. So it's just really unfortunate. And honestly, it makes me feel a little bit better with how things are going this year. Um, and then I look on the defensive side and I'm like, look, you have to draft better. You're going to have to spend money on oh, yeah. agents. And, and for me, it's, and I, I think I made a comment earlier this week. Where I'm like, oh, put, you know, you need to go on a shopping spree. I don't mean like a Browns where you just spend a bunch of money and you pay all these guys and it doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. I mean, you need to get value. You need to bring big guys and you need to get a contract done, extension done with Trey Hendrickson. Um, that's going to have to be something that happens. But the team still has plenty of money to spend, even if they do pay T. Even if they do pay Jamar, even if they do add to Trey Hendrickson, um, you know, I just stop. There's nobody else on the books besides Joe Burrow, and it's still friendly. It's still going to look like a steal, especially the season that Joe Burrow is having going into next year. So it just it's very frustrating. And I feel like it finally has hit me this week where I'm like, you might have to rethink the T thing. You might really have to revisit, and I know how they feel about them, but they're going to have to get over it and be be a franchise that gets on gets on with the times. You're going to have yeah, to guarantee yeah. this money. These players, that's what they play for. Don't let him go away. And, and I would say the same thing for what we just watched with Jesse Bates. It is very unfortunate because your replacements 
will never be that star player that you already know you have. Stop trying to, you know, replace them with someone who you think you can you can just get in the draft or they're going to be cheaper. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't in 2024. So just a little frustrated with how things are going when it yeah, comes no. to the big picture. One more point on the T. Higgins thing is that I hear all the time, like, you can't pay two wide receivers and win a Super Bowl. To me, that's nonsense because the Colts won their only Super Bowl with Peyton the year they paid Wayne to go with paying Harrison. Then you look at tight ends. Like, Travis Kelsey is basically a wide receiver. You're paying him and Tyree Kill when the Chiefs win a couple of Super Bowls. You're looking at Gronk and Edelman getting paid. And most importantly, I think one that makes – this blows this out and this one doesn't get mentioned because I think this offense kind of stunk in the playoffs, mm -hmm. but the Broncos were paying both Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders big money when they won the Super Bowl. Now that offense stunk, but they were still paying Like if you're not, there's two parts here. One is yes, you can pay both. Like the point is just pay your good players. Like mm -hmm. stop paying average players because that's where you don't get your money back. Even if the contract looks below market value, the market on average players is too high. Look at what the Panthers had to pay for average level guard play. I'm, I'm talking about pay your good players. The second part is when you're talking about like, oh, no team has won a Super Bowl doing this. Well, you're really just talking about what have what has Brady and Mahomes done because they've won seven out of the last ten Super Bowls. I, yeah. I mean, other than that, it's the Rams, the Broncos, and the Eagles. So you either build one of those three teams or you have the GOAT quarterback if you're just going to look at the history. I'm I'm okay paying – the like doing yeah. – being different, being different, being the team that pays two awesome wide receivers with an awesome quarterback. Yeah, the Dolphins and the Eagles don't look awesome. Guess what? Joe Burrow's a better quarterback than those and two. And both of them. So, yeah, than both of them. So that's the one part of this. Two, the Eagles, you're going to complain about it. A.J. Brown has missed every game except week one, and Devonta Smith missed last week. So you're really just watching him throw to Jahan Dotson. Like, yeah, that offense looks bad. And the Dolphins offense, it looked bad before, but Tua's hurt. So I don't feel like that's also that fair, but it's also this Bengals offense is a better version of those at the moment. So, so I don't know. Anyway, this is all about the defense. I know, sorry. Stinks. The defense that's just stinks. That's you know, why... Like, yeah, between the defense the is ears, so bad. Not between the ears. They don't communicate well. Like, that's the most frustrating thing that I watch is that, you know, you're looking at Cam Taylor, but point, point, point. He's taking, hey, I'm passing this shallow. This is zero. Mm -hmm. and there's no help besides if I pass this to you and you pass yours to me, ah, nobody picks him up and he runs away. Now, I don't know. Maybe he's not supposed to pass off in zero. I don't know the rules on that shallow, but, or on that play call, but that's a miscommunication, right? And then you have another play where, your green dot of the defense, Logan Wilson, and your team captain of the defense and Jermaine Pratt drop to the same zone on a play. And I know they're not supposed to do that because it looks stupid, first of all. It looks like a glitch where they both open up the exact same way and start running to the same exact spot. And there's a void where one of them's supposed to be. That's just the easiest 11-yard gain you could think of. And those are just two examples, but those happen throughout the game. Just missed assignments, miscommunications. Like, yeah, we can complain about, oh, that they, they don't have the athleticism. And I think that's true. Like, they don't have any athleticism at safety. They don't have much athleticism at linebacker. Akeem Davis Gaither looks a lot different than every other linebacker gets out there. And that's why I want to see him on the field more because he can move. But when I'm watching, it's just like, if you're not going to be assignment sound, you're not going to communicate well, you're going to have busts. You're going to like, that makes you a bad defense. What takes them over the top is just, they don't tackle that, you know, like no. if you're going to be bad talent, you're going to be slow. You have to at least be sound. I think that's the biggest thing. And the Lou Anarumo defense was so sound in 2021 and 2022, where it felt like a hive mind. Everybody worked together. It seemed like the pass rush worked with the coverage and they all worked together in the run fits and TJ readers holding guys up so that, you know, you can get an awesome fill from Logan Wilson or Jermaine Pratt. And you're not getting any of that right now where it doesn't seem like guys work together when they make stops, they make stops, but it doesn't seem like it was like some combined effort, a hive mind on the defense. Think of the games that they played in the playoffs against the Titans against the yeah. Chiefs both times against the Rams in the Super Bowl. You can say whatever you want, but for most of that game, that defense was really good. It's the reason they were so far in that game. It's tough. It's tough to watch this because I don't know who I want to blame. And then I look up. I've compared this team to the 2012 Saints before. And you know what I looked up? Is that defense stunk? And you know who the defensive coordinator was? 
Steve Spagnolo. So <laughs> there's only no. so much you can do. There's only Life so is a much full you circle. Can do. I know. When I saw that, I was like, oh my god. So like, yeah. I'm not saying Lou Anarumo is Steve Spagnuolo, but there's good defensive coordinators. Clearly, a great defensive coordinator with a great offense couldn't save what was going on with that defense. So that's just – it's frustrating. I don't think there's a defensive mind that's just going to save this defense, but mm -hmm. it might be best for everybody to part because why would Lou Anarumo still want to stick around when they let all his best players walk? He has to try to make, make this work – without having good players and then yeah. why do the Bengals want to keep running this when they need certain level talents for this defense to work maybe that means you bring i mean every every fan base has already made the uh the photoshop of robert sala but yeah. you know like if that's an opportunity yeah like there there is in my head it would suck to me, to lose Lou Anarumo. I don't have a goal. I still love break. him so much. I think so he's many. I think he's a very good defensive coordinator. He's the only guy that gives the, these elite quarterbacks fits. I don't care if once in a while Mike White has a game. Those are regular season games. When he game plans it up and he draws his defense up, like you might look at the end of season ranks like, oh, they were only 11th in points allowed. Who cares? Because when they got to the playoffs, he was amazing. That's my biggest thing. And that was the thing with Bates too. It's like, Oh, he doesn't play as consistent in the regular. Who cares? When if you get to the playoffs, this guy is amazing. Oh, like those are the games that matter. It's like, why would we care more about some September game against the Jets than you would in the playoffs against the Chiefs, against the Bills? So that's just a whole lot of frustration I've had, some revelations, and a very interesting defensive coordinator for the 2012 New Orleans Saints. Yeah, and maybe Spags will come come be the DC for his favorite one of his favorite quarterbacks. <laughs> he would have to be the head coach. He's not leaving. He's not leaving Kansas City unless he's a head coach. I mean, you sometimes you just get tired of winning over there, and you want to come over and and the challenge. He's tired of winning. Um, but uh, but uh, no, I it's honestly and, and just real quick because we'll wrap this up. Didn't mean to go super long, but I agree with you. There's not a whole lot to go back and look. Like, let's break this down with the defense. They miss tackles. They're not playing good. They're not communicating. Everyone is slow, and it's it's we're gonna have to see something different when they go to New York. It does not get easier. We mm -hmm. will we will preview that and how Daniel Jones is playing. And honestly, to be determined if Malik Neighbors is playing, but uh, that would be a tough task for this defense um but we will talk about it sounds crazy to say but all of that is true and we'll talk about it on thursday's podcast but for lou anarumo i think there's a lot of scapegoats we want to blame game you know who is who's to blame is it this player this player is it lou anarumo is it zach taylor um you know i agree with you i lou has done so many great things here i'm not ready to say goodbye to lou this year i i probably would see him finish out the season um but at some point oh, yeah i don't what's the point like, yeah, what's the point? who it's are not... you promote? Like, I don't know who they have that they could promote mm -hmm. that makes sense. Or to me, any of the like mid-season firings are really more for like fan bases. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess Salah just got fired, but that was his quarterback making that decision. <laughs> it's like when your team's done, you fire that guy. So that's that's where I stand on it. I mean, yeah. what you're not going to install a whole new defense. Like you mm -hmm. can't fire Lou right now. Hire Salah and he runs his awesome defense. You know, Salah hasn't been the best defensive coordinator when he doesn't have talent either. Like when these guys get talent, they're good. And that's my whole point here is like we're scapegoating Lou, is mm -hmm. what it is. I don't have a goldfish brain. I remember him being a very good defensive coordinator. I think he doesn't have much talent. Do they need a fresh mind? Maybe. Like maybe, maybe, maybe they just make a change and that makes sense. Maybe they hire somebody like Salah and it makes sense. But when I'm looking at it, it's frustrating, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to do because it's, it, they have the traits of like a not well coached team, but you've seen that before with good defensive coordinators like Spag, Sala, like they all have had years where it doesn't look like it's working. And why is that? It's to me, a lot of this always falls on the players and people don't want to hear that because it's easier to blame the coach. And it's easier fix to fix the coach than it is to get a lot of new players. That's exactly. And then this last thing I'm going to say, we are wrapping this up. A player should have accountability too. I know nobody's ready for that conversation, but these players are missing the tackles. Lou is trying to put Lou tried to do everything possible in that game versus the Baltimore Ravens, treating different guys in and out. Um, obviously, running all different fronts, blitzing, not blitzing, everything. dropping eight. Yeah, I mean, he, he was, went he was through bad. the whole role of that. It feels like he was scrambling to find some type of answer, and nothing was available. And Lou might say at the end of the season, "Look, I'm done. I'm done." Yeah. 
I think I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm going to take a break for a second, or I, I think I'm ready to go. You know, we don't, we don't know what all this is going to look like. And maybe, maybe they will need a new fresh mind on the defensive coordinator side, but I still believe in Lou. His players on the defensive side, not so much right now, would love to be proven wrong, would love for them to get out of this one and four hole. Um, we can all look at history and stats and everything like that, but this defense is, it's really frustrating. It's infuriating. And Paul Dana wrote about that today, infuriating and hope when he looks at the Bengals one and four record. And I'm like, that's exactly how I feel. I'm frustrated when I look at it. I'm frustrated with the defense. And then I have a little tiny bit of hope because I look at this offense and the way the offense is playing. So it's just such a mixture of emotions. And it's just so unfortunate because this team is playing good ball at times on one side of the ball and terrible on the other side, brutal defense. And I just... I don't know. I don't think one player and honestly how fun it would be to trade for a player. They're not trading for a player. And I don't think one player is going to make a difference on this defense. I would just like maybe just see some of the younger guys. Um, I I don't want to see Geno Stone and Von Bell again, but I know we'll probably get one more game with the both of them out there. Um, At least. Yeah. Geno Stone, worse than Nick Scott so far at PFF. Exactly. That's why I I don't We're ready to burn Nick Scott's house down, but Gino Stone hasn't gotten that, but yeah, this time to wrap it up. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Oh, sorry. That was frustrating. I feel like I need a little vent session for this one and four start in this defensive performance by the Bengals defense. Um, we'll have more later this week. Bengals get back to practice on Wednesday. Mike, what's going to be up on all Bengals? Already up. Orlando Brown article. I think he's playing the best ball of his career. We didn't get to talk about it, so read about it. <laughs> Orlando, we will, we will talk about you on Thursday's podcast as we get ready for the New York Giants to Cincinnati Bengals primetime Sunday night football action. Make sure you follow Mike Bengals underscore Sand. You can follow me at LNDS Patterson. Thank you for listening, too. It's always game day in Cincinnati. <laughs>